my name is Tom McIntosh. I'm the head of the Department of Political Science here at the University of Regina, and it's my privilege to introduce our speaker tonight. Before I do, I want to thank the sponsors of tonight's lecture, the Center for the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, and especially Simon Enoch for his work in making the arrangements to bring uh, Professor Page here tonight. The Faculty of Arts at the University of Regina, including the Departments of Sociology and Political Science, and indeed the School of Journalism, uh, and Kevin met with some very eager and interesting journalism students this morning. The Johnson Shoyama Graduate School of Public Policy, the Faculty of Business Administration, the University of Regina Faculty Association, the Public Service Alliance of Canada's Women's Committee, and the Saskatchewan Uni Union of Nurses. The diversity of that list of sponsors speaks really to the esteem with which Professor Page is held and the eagerness for Canadians to want to hear what he has to say about our institutions of government and governance and by extension what that means for our democratic practices as a nation. Currently, Kevin Page is the Jean-Luc Pepin Research Chair in Political Studies in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Ottawa. Prior to becoming an academic, Professor Page worked for 27 years in the federal public service, mostly in central agencies responsible for budgeting, including the Department of Finance, Treasury Board Secretariat, and the Privy Council Office. In 2008, he left his position as Assistant Secretary for Macroeconomic Policy at PCO to become Canada's first parliamentary budget officer, a position he held until earlier this year. And it was during that time as parliamentary budget officer that Professor Page became known to Canadians. His office is penchant for insisting on its independence, as any office of parliament should, and for publishing analysis that at times contradicted the, the analysis issued by the government, made headlines, and, more on one, and on more than one occasion put the government on the defensive. And I was thinking while the government may have been on the defensive with some, it also tended to be on the offense when it came to its relationship with Mr. Page. Like the Office of the Auditor General, the Parliamentary Budget Office quickly became an important and vital element in Canadians' push for greater levels of transparency and accountability from its government. And it's fair to say that Kevin Page epitomizes the view that the true role of the public servant is to speak truth to power, even when that truth is not what the powerful want to hear. And we're incredibly fortunate tonight that Professor Page is going to speak his truth to us. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Page. Thank you so much for coming. I know it's not, we didn't get the best weather. I don't think I brought the weather. From Ottawa, though maybe I did. Um, a great day today. I, I got in early. I got to speak to students, as Tom said. Got to be inspired by by journalism students. Got a, you know some tough questions, just as tough as I got at the house. It's just as tough questions as I got, as I got at the House Finance Committee. Um, actually, I would say tougher questions than the House Finance Committee. Uh, but it was a good thing that Mr. 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 Goodell wasn't at that committee when I was there, so they would have been even tougher. Um, yeah, just a great day, and you know, I got to listen to people from you know, Regina and talking about issues like the big referendum, and I was just reading the Prairie Dog, and if, if, you know, to get the sense of, like, you know, uh, of what was going on. I was, to be honest, inspired by the turnout, and just from the level of discussion, the civic engagement around that issue, and uh, what a great project that would have been for a budget office. Uh, you know, yeah. But not just that, I mean, other issues, people just talking about just in the matter of a course of conversation, the football stadium, I got to learn about the lean uh, system that's being used in the government ran to try to find efficiencies. And um, so like a really nice day and I'm just spoiled with hospitality. I've definitely put on two or three pounds. Uh, so thank you very much. It's just always the hospitality you get when you come to Saskatchewan for sure. And it's famous for that. Just a, just a word, I want to thank, obviously, Simon and Cheryl for amazing hospitality and the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. We need the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives in this country. We need, you know, I wish we had more, but thank God we have the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives. 
And um, I know this is a, partly a fundraising drive as well for them. And I've, you know, I've been involved with them. You know, you know I've, I've had the opportunity to speak in Toronto and in Ottawa with the center and just the work that they do. And if you just, you know, and I just scanned through, I hadn't seen this publication, but you know, the publication to highlight some of their studies. And uh, I think the lean, the lean people should look at the studies that comes out of the, uh, you know, the, the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives to see how pro productive they are. But you know, on every you know every possible issue, like you know, from power issues to to uh, to privatization of liquor issues to environmental issues, labor issues, you know, I understand they're working on a big project looking at the cost of living, you know, kind of a wage issue within respect to this area that has seen a lot of growth in higher house prices that cuts in on disposable income as well. So, like, you absolutely need that, and you know when you need it because you know. You know, and I know uh, Simon's been involved writing opinion pieces for, uh, you know, around this, this big issue, the referendum last night, and uh, you actually need that kind of analysis so that you just, you feel like you, it helps civic, civic engagement, and I think that was a testimony. So I, a few months ago, Simon asked me to come and to say a few words, and so I said, Simon, what do we talk about? So we negotiated a title. And uh, so the title is The State of Canada's Parliamentary Institutions, What It Means for Our Democracy and Prosperity, and kind of a view from me as the, as the Parliamentary Budget Officer. And thank you, Tom, for those amazing remarks. You know, I'm, just now, I'm not really quite used to being called a professor. Uh, it still hasn't sunk in yet, but it's a great environment, a great environment to be in a learning environment. It's yeah, actually nice if we can get Parliament to be more of a learning environment. But we're working on it. So I guess I'd like to have a conversation of, you know, of these institutions, you know, the state of our parliamentary institutions. Um, but I'd like to do it, I'd like to set it up a little bit, just a, a few comments about what's going on, you know, this fall actually, what will likely go on uh, this fall with respect to the Senate and the speech on the throne. Just a little bit of a setup, because that will influence, uh, it'll have an influence of political discussions over the next year to two years. And then talk a little bit about just a few words about the economy and the fiscal situation, because that shapes, you know, uh, how what our political leaders do and how they look at, you know, budget issues coming up. And then to, to finally to talk about institutions, if that's okay. And um, I have three kind of overarching messages. I find as I get older, it's really important to have no more than three, and I just say them at the beginning because I'll probably lose track of it as I start speaking. So I, the first three overarching messages. One. I think for me, like the road to 2015, like it's an election year coming up, and you know it's very important to democracy. Elections are not the only, you know, they're not the most, they're probably are as, as important as anything in a democracy. But it, you know, we have one in 2015, and for me, it starts this fall. I think it gets restarted, and it's going to get restarted with the speech from the throne, and that we're going to see in just a few weeks' time, in the middle of October. And I think, to me, I think as a Canadian citizen now, as a professor that gets to hang out with you know amazing students, like I did today here at the School of Journalism, um, the country needs a discussion about priorities and policy directions. That's you know that goes beyond the electoral cycle, but it, you know that's long term. That inspires all of us to want to do things. And I think so. We, I'm hoping we get that discussion. And I think at the same time, I think for you know opposition parties. I think you know. I think you know. We know. I, I have a feeling that you know, uh, that the prime minister is going to come out strong with the speech from the throne. I think you know. For, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think he needs to do that. But I think you know, for the opposition parties, it's a time for them to shine too. I think this fall, and I think they need to start to show their cards with respect to what are their policies and priorities are. Uh, I think it's an important time for the opposition parties as well. So again, number one message, I think the road to the 2015 election gets restarted right now in the fall with the speech from the throne. Number two, I think the government is on track to balance its books over the medium term, the fiscal balance issue, and they talked, the conservative government's talked a lot about that. I think we, you know, even with relatively weak growth and a lot of uncertainty, I still think we're gonna get to balance, and, and you know, that's a good thing, and I think, um, you know, but one, I don't think the provinces, and PBO actually released a report today, PBO, the Parmenty Budget Office, released a report. It's their fourth annual report on fiscal sustainability. So a little bit like actuaries, we look to the long term, and we look at this, you know, fiscal structures, you know, at the federal level, the provincial and, and municipal level, and then we look at the pension system, the Canada Pension Plan and the Quebec Pension Plan. And we you know when PBO released the report today, basically what they're saying is that the federal government's actually in pretty good shape when you look at aging demographics and you look at that fiscal structure. Will it stabilize the size of our debt relative to the economy? So federal government's in pretty good shape. And uh, provincially, though, we have a gap. 
you know, they estimate what that gap is. And they say, like, we would need to take actions about two percentage points of GDP. And our, our economy is about $1.8 trillion. So that'd be like $18 billion actions right across the provinces in order to kind of close that gap to stabilize debt because we're going to face this aging demographic issue. Um, you know, I love that quote from Woody Allen. He, Woody Allen says, um, no, I won't go. I'll save it for later. How do you save a Woody Allen quote for later? No, what Woody Allen is, is like, what do you think of aging? He says, I'm against it. <laughs> like, what do you do? You can't do it. You know, if you're an economist and you look at demographics, a very important issue, and you look at your fiscal structures, you know, there's going to be pressures on certain types of programs, and it has impacts for the economy, too. And health care is a very big issue. And because it's a very big issue for provincial governments. And you know, a little while back, the prime minister, the finance minister, decided that they were going to solve the problem by just cutting, reducing an escalator, the amount of money that they transferred to the provinces. So they took a lot of that fiscal burden and they threw it onto the laps of the provinces, over the provinces to solve. But it doesn't really solve anything until we have that, you know, that national conversation. So we need that. So number two, I think fiscally, though, we're in good shape at the federal level. Provinces, we got work to do. That's not a massive gap two percentage points. We had bigger issues back in the 1990s, so we can close that gap, but you need to take actions. You can't just, uh, you can't avoid it. Number three message, I would say the House of, Con the, the House of Commons, where I got to work uh, and to support over the past five years, they, they've lost control of the public purse. And I want to talk a little bit about what I mean that. And, you know, so we send members of parliament you know, to, um, to Ottawa, and then we don't give them the information that they need to do their jobs to hold the executive to account. And I think that's a big failure. And there's a lot of literature right now, I highlight some of it, that basically you know, just speaks to what that means for democracy and what that means for prosperity down the road. And I think you know, the system is broken, and I have no troubles telling you why it's broken. I can tell you, you know, just from my own experiences as the parliamentary budget officer, what they got and what they didn't get, and what we tried to give them, and, and the, the, the reaction we got from the government. And what concerns me is we kind of pretend like this doesn't matter you know, as, as citizens. And again, I'm kind of inspired by what went through what you had, what happened yesterday in the referendum here in Regina. And I think we need to have that kind of civic engagement across the country about, you know, the importance of these institutions because it does matter. I think it's fair to say when we, we're losing trust, you know, I think in Parliament. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Senate. And that has implications for our democracy. And I think, you know, and I think we also know what it's like to lose confidence in fiscal management. I think, again, as I said, I think fiscally we're in pretty good shape. Um, but I think the lessons that we learned in the 1990s and when, uh, when Mr. Gooda had to solve a big fiscal problem for us, in, you know, in Ottawa, is that, you know, this, those seeds of the next fiscal crisis, they get planted early. And so, like, one of the things, one of the reasons why they created the Parliamentary Budget Office was to throw up flags when you saw issues that were coming down. You know, fighter planes that, you know, the government would say, we can get those on the cheap. And we say, no, you're not going to get them that cheap. You know, our crime bills, they say, you know, we could be tough on crime. It doesn't cost anything. I said, well, actually, it does cost things. If you put more people in prisons and you keep them there longer, there will be a cost. So you have to worry about, like, planting those seeds for the fiscal crisis, the next fiscal crisis. And we, they do come. So just a few words in that context about the pl a political context and challenges. As I said, I think the road to the next federal election, it starts in the fall with the tabling and the SFT. To me, the transition, or the challenge actually for Parliament is the transition, you know, from relative dysfunction and, you know, what you see for the most part when you watch, you, you watch news and reads the newspapers about what's going on in the Senate and the House to relative function. So that's a challenge that parliamentarians all face, and uh, they're going to face it this fall. And I think, again, as I said, I think the challenge for the opposition parties now, while well, the federal government's going to put forth its speech on the throne, is they're going to have to present their vision. What is their vision for the, you know, for the economy? What's their vision for uh, social programs? What is their vision for the environment, uh, for, for the next generation, our kids? And I think if they just oppose, uh, and I think they're going to miss an important opportunity. So then the question becomes, like, who's going to occupy the high road in this debate over the fall? If we're, again, moving forward to 2015. Like my own feeling is that road is vacant right now. It's open territory, and there are huge opportunities for all parties. Okay, a few words on the Senate spending scandal. For me, the Senate is a trust issue, which I think in many cases, unfortunately, some very, you know, some unfortunate senators have lost the trust of Canadians. It's not a fiscally material issue in the Senate right now. And I think as all parliamentarians know, even the parliamentary budget officer knows, the governor of the Bank of Canada knows you need trust to lead. And once you lose it, you can't get it back. It's very hard to get it back. 
and, and there's a major price to that. And you cannot institutionalize trust. You can't just say, well, I'm part of this great institution called Parliament, so you've got to trust me. You know, I think you've got to earn that trust. And I think they've lost it. And I think also the Senate is a major policy distraction right now that's going to drag, has the potential to drag on. And I think that's, that's uh, going to be a major, a major issue. I think it's going to be a hard issue for public servants providing policy direction in the next speech on the throne. But I think it's also going to be hard, like for the prime minister, to table that speech on the throne and then keep the focus on, on you know, over the next number of months leading up to the budget. I think, ironically, though, I think it creates pressure on the prime minister to change the channel. And I thought, like, prorogation, and I'm somebody that worked at, you know, in, in Langevin for a number of years, um, and, the, you know, prorogation might have been a signal that the prime minister looked at his speech on the throne when he came back at the end of the summer and says, it's not good enough. You know, we need to strengthen it. This will not change the channel away from the Senate. Uh, robocalls or whatever the issue of the day is, you know, depending on the day, we need to, have, we need to kind of start inspiring Canadians. So, again, then the question becomes, how, the, how are the opposition parties going to respond in that kind of context? I don't think the Senate problem could be fixed from within. And I think we're going to need, we're going to need the AG, certainly the Auditor General, to help. And we might even need more than the Auditor General to help. And I think this, the long-run issue of the Senate, I don't think it gets fixed between now and the election, but I think it needs to be debated. What kind of Senate do we want in this country? Uh, and I think that's a big election issue in 2015. But that debate could start. It could start now if it doesn't get solved. But there's a nice quote that I like from this, you know, this novelist, uh, American novelist, Upton Sinclair, and it kind of speaks to how these, you know, when you have these problems, how they get fixed. And he said 100 years ago, it is difficult to get a man, or you could say a person, to understand something when, his, or when their salary depends on, on them not understanding it. <laughs> you know, very wise advice 100 years ago. It is difficult to get a man to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. So I don't think the Senate's going to fix the problem. These internal committees that are responsible for these sorts of issues, they're not going to solve it. So, you know, the AG is going to come in and it's going to do, you know, do a financial audit. It's going to find more problems. Trust is going to become a bigger issue. Uh, but I think the solution is going to have to come from a bigger political discussion. Just a few words about political polling. And now that I'm no longer the Parliamentary Budget Office, I get to look at these things. And, you know, in the context of, up, and also some upcoming by-elections. I, you know, I know somebody, somebody like me that worked in the Langevin building with, you know, where the Prime Minister would have his office, that, you know, I could, in work one floor above the Prime Minister's office, that's something they're always interested in. Like, I never totally understand it or appreciate it, but they're always very interested in polling. You know, the average monthly polling numbers, how do they change the vital movements in them? And I think a lot of us, when we see what happens in various elections, we say, like, are they even accurate? Uh, but nonetheless, they look at them. And I think when I look at those average monthly polling numbers, you know, since the last election, there's been a lot of change. And I think the numbers have shifted and they've actually tightened a fair bit. And I think I know having worked in Langevin, that gets people excited. That would get the government excited. They could start to feel a little bit of pressure. And, you know, I think the latest, uh, you know, the latest monthly numbers kind of show that if we were to have an election right now, there, there wouldn't be a majority government, there'd be a minority government the conservatives would probably still squeak it out. But I think that would actually, you know, you know I, don't, I can't say I know the prime minister personally, that would bother the prime minister. You know, after you had the chance to lead in a majority, to go back to a minority would be a very difficult thing. And then we also have these by-elections that are going to come up. There's four of them, actually. There's two in Manitoba, one in Ontario and Quebec. And they're going to be, you know, people are going to watch very carefully, you know, you know how do the, which signals do you get from those by-elections and politically. I mean, all this said is, like, this creates pressure. I like pressure. You know, I think it make, it, it, this kind of pressure is it, going to hopefully lift these people up to respond in a better way. It's at least an opportunity for them to respond in a better way. And I think hopefully, you know, the opposition parties as well, they come back and this fall with the speech on the throne, they debate priorities. And yeah, we need to fix the Senate, but it can't be the only issue facing, you know, Canadians for the next, you know, couple of years and longer. So this, I think the political stakes are rising. And so we need parties to put some cards on the table. I think this debate for the 2015 election starts now. Okay, a few words about the economy and the fiscal situation. I mean, for me, I think the challenge still for Minister Flaherty, I think, and, and I think for Cabinet, when they're looking at the budget, still a lot of international uncertainty, more than that they would like. Um, these are not, you know, easy times. And, you know, and, and I think, you know, the, the uncertainty is, is, is shifting, you know, and it's coming from different directions. But I think the challenge is also fiscal choice which it doesn't get debated a lot, thank you very much, you know, in, in Ottawa or even, you know, in, on these sort of national talk shows. There is fiscal choice. I think for the federal government, they made a choice. 
They said, we're going to get back to balance over the medium term. And by medium term means usually over the next five years. So by 2015, 16, you know, they have a relatively small deficit now. You know, probably it'll probably 13, 14, probably less than $20 billion. So about a percentage point of GDP. They're going to get that back to balance. And so, but the choice for them is like, do you keep that course? Now you have the speech on the throne, you have the Senate issues, like do you stay, this is, we still want this, or do you, we still want to get back to balance, it's the most important thing for us, we don't want to go into the next election with still running deficits after the liberals had all those surpluses from the you know, late 1990s up until you know, 2007 and eight. You know, do we, do we want to move forward with some bold initiatives and what would be the cost for those initiatives? And what would be those initiatives to strengthen the economy? or deal with uh, you know, some social challenges or deal with environmental issues. I think just on the economy, I think for me, I think the short-term, medium-term economic outlook for Canada is not, not gonna change very much. So from the, those people in Langevin, the Prime Minister's office writing the speech on the throne, they were saying, okay, what's the economic context? Is it shifting on us? It's not really shifted. Like the overall numbers are gonna stay the same. I think like for Canada, you know, this you know, means kind of sluggish growth. Like growth probably more in the 2% range for this year, next year, maybe getting a little bit stronger. And that's actually, you know, we would have, I'm sure, given that the economy is still operating below potential, they would like something much higher, uh, much higher than, and they're not getting it. Without that growth, which, without higher growth, you don't get the progress in terms of reducing that unemployment rate. And if you're going into the next election and you have an unemployment of 7%, that's not necessarily so good when they came in and the unemployment was, rate was less than 6%. I think, you know, unfortunately, maybe I'm sure the Prime Minister thinks about this from time to time, like he hasn't been so lucky, and it's, you know, it's hard for me to be sympathetic to the Prime Minister, but he hasn't been so lucky, and in a sense, like, you know, since, uh, certainly at least since 2008, it's been one crisis, uh, you know, effectively one big crisis, but almost within that one big crisis, a lot of little crises that keep getting passed on, certainly the financial crisis that led to the big recession. And then you could see that spread, you know, right across the world, like literally a world recession, which is something we hadn't seen since, you know, the 1930s. And then, you know, and then more sustainability issues, like in the United States and the UK. And, so, and then now, actually, what you're seeing, like what's being highlighted by the World Bank and the IMF is that kind of weakness is now showing up in these bigger emerging economies like India and China, not growing quite as fast, still growing astronomically compared to our numbers, but they're slowing down. They're dealing with some, you know, some bottlenecks. Um, so again, this weak growth will keep, you know, keep a lid on the you know, and progress in dealing in terms of dealing with their unemployment rate over the next few years, and that's going to be frustrating. And then, you know, that's always a very important issue uh, for for parliamentarians. You know, the number one issue to kind of promote good employment. So again, back just to the fiscal choice that the government looked at, to getting back to balance, you know, in 2015, what does it mean? You know, basically, like for an economist, like for us, when we look at the numbers, like the government is in a position of austerity right now. They actually put the brakes on federally. So we had a big stimulus package in 2009 and 10. You saw all those Canada Action Plan signs. You know, a lot of work done on, on bridges and roads that stimulated growth. And that lasted for 2009 and 10. That was like almost $50 billion. And again, we had like, like a $1.6 trillion economy. That's a lot of stimulus. So that's like for you and I pulling out a credit card and just and spending. Getting this, you know, maybe getting work done around the house, what have you. That provides a nice little boost to the economy. But then in 2012, the government said, no, we have to put the brakes on. You know, we have a problem now. You know, we were telling the, you know, the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister, you have a bit of a structural deficit here that you created when you cut that extra point of GST. And so they, you know, they said, no, no, we don't have a structural deficit. But then they behaved like they did. They said, no, we have to start cutting spending now. We're going to free spending in departments. And uh, so they put the brakes on. So when you put the brakes on like that, that has an impact on the economy. Just a stimulus, when the government had stimulus uh, in 2009 and 10, they came out with a budget. They said, you know, if we spend 47 or $50 billion federally in the province and spend an extra 10 or 50, we'll create, we'll create output, more output, we'll create more jobs. And the same, the same thing happens with austerity. If the government says now we're going to pull back, and particularly pull back when the economy is weak, then that has an impact on output and jobs. So we'll lose. We'll probably lose a percentage point of GDP. We'll lose, you know, you know maybe 150 to 200,000 jobs because of that, you know, pulling back through that austerity. And that's a conscious choice. And uh, that the government has a hard time, um, you know, talking about this sort of trade-off. Like for me, I just think it is a trade-off. And it could be a positive or a negative trade-off depending on how you look at it. The good thing, though, is if we achieve it, and I say if we achieve getting back to balance, so whoever takes over in 2015 is going to have a good set of books. They're going to have some room to maneuver. 
you know, we, that structural deficit that they created, that'll be eliminated. They'll be in kind of what we call structural balance, meaning the economy's back at potential, we're back in balance. And, you know, that's for the most part a good thing. Again, the province is still dealing with a, you know, a fairly significant issue, and they're going to have to deal with health care as we look to the long term. So again, just in terms of that broader context, so we have this uncertainty. But even with sluggish growth, Canada's in pretty good shape. You know, we have these deficits, one and a half, two percentage points of GDP federally, pretty much matched at the provincial level. Like our debt to GDP ratio, it's probably, you know, federally it's in the, you know, relative to the size economy, it's about 33, 34 percent. You know, and back in the mid 1990s, just to give you a reference point, it was like 66 percent. You know, and I think when, when, when Finance Minister Mr. Martin took over in the mid-1990s, like for every, for every dollar he was taking in in budgetary revenues, he was spending about 36, 37 cents on debt interest charges, like that credit card bill. When Minister Flaherty took over in 2006, he was spending about 13 cents on every revenue dollar. So that matters. That's all room to maneuver. If you're a finance minister, and Mr. Goodell knows this better than anybody, you know, and you know, if you're paying upwards of 30, 40 cents on every revenue dollar that's coming in on debt interest, you don't have any room to maneuver. At 13 cents, you could look, as I say, like a rock star. You know, you have all that room to maneuver to look at new programs uh, that, that could help you know, Canadians in, in all different kinds of circumstances. So room to maneuver is very important. Okay, now, the, the reason why I came here, to talk a little bit about institutions and some of the challenges. And again, as I said, I think the challenge is to restore functionality to Parliament, to restore trust. And I think the challenge is also is, to tell, is for us to kind of remind ourselves why these institutions matter. And I think the challenge is our indifference and our, what I would call our willful and bl you know, blindness to all these issues. You know, Alan Scheck, this professor at the University of Maryland, he said, like, budgeting is really about three things. He says, number one, it's like, you know, we know this from just, you know, being, you know, managing our, our, our budgets in our houses. It's about, you know, living within constraints, you know, with reasonable constraints, you know, often presented in terms of fiscal balance, you know, in, in a federal government context. But it's also about how you allocate your money. And it's also about whether you spend that money efficiently. Again, and I hate to use that word lean kind of context. I'm not sure I'm a big fan of lean. But that kind of the context of, you know, are you spending money efficiently? Like for in the case of a federal government, like are you running these big programs, you know, supporting potentially farmers? Are you running, you know, can you, like what does it cost you to, 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 to process a stabilization check or crop, crop insurance check? Is it a, an efficient kind of process? Or the same thing for an elderly person. Like what is, are you efficient? And again, the allocation. I was mind, and just a you know, week ago. I had just you know I was exchanging emails with uh, with former Prime Minister Joe Clark. And he's I think he's releasing a book this this um, this fall. And he said, Kevin, you got to help me out on this. I need some information. Like, what have we spent over the last ten years on security? What's happened to security spending in this country? What have we spent on diplomacy and development? Can you give me some numbers? And, you know, when you put those numbers together, it's a very good question. It deals with allocation. Like, we spent four times as much in terms of growth on security, you know, than we did, you know, in terms of increased spending on development and diplomacy. So, again, what does that mean? So I think, like, you know, you want parliamentarians when they come to Ottawa to talk about balance. And we do not a bad job on balance, but you also want to have really rich conversations. Are we spending the money the way we want to spend it? Your money, taxpayer money. Are we doing it efficiently? And again, we do fine on the, on the overall balance issue for the, since you know, the mid-1990s, but we do a lousy job on allocation and efficiency in, in terms of explaining it. There's a quote I like from William Gladstone, a former exchequer and prime minister of the UK you know, in the late 1800s. He said, if the House of Commons by any possibility, loses the power of the purse. Again, that power of the purse concept. It's actually written in our Constitution. Of the grants of public money, depend on it. Your very liberty will be worth very little by comparison. That whole issue of accountability. Very, very noble. We send MPs you know, you know, from all across the country to Ottawa to basically keep the government in check, provide that check, you know, that, you know, that check on, on the federal government power. Very noble job. Like, let the prime minister do his job. Let the cabinet do its job. Let them propose budgets. You know, let's see the priorities in the speech on the throne. Let them put legislation of parliament. But then give, the, give our members of parliament across the country what they need to hold the executive into account to make sure that we have not just good fiscal balance, but good allocation of money, good efficient money, good policies for Canadians now and to the future. 
So again, that power of the purse written right into our Constitution in the Financial Administration Act, it doesn't rest with the Prime Minister. It rests with the individual MP. Very nice piece by Andrew Coyne in, in a, the Walrus Magazine, recent edition, about how to restore, you know, uh, you know, the Parliament, how to restore the strength of the individual MP. And he basically makes the claim, like, you need to stand up for your own rights, individual MPs. Like, we have far too much party discipline, and, and, and we're going in the wrong direction. So then the question becomes, and this is a question that I faced, and the question that created a lot of st stress for me over the last five years as the budget officer, do you want members of Parliament? Do you, you know, before they vote, do you want them to have financial information? Like, why wouldn't you? I just automatically, why does that have to be such a hard thing to achieve? Um, and I can honestly tell you, like, and again, I'm somebody that's been, as, as Tom said, 27 years working at finance, working at the Privy Council office, working at Treasury, I worked at fisheries and oceans, worked at agriculture. Very rarely, you know, the Prime Minister gets great information. The finance minister gets great information. Cabinet, for the most part, gets great information. But parliament, to do that job of holding the government to account, never, never see it. Never got what they really needed. We give them lots of stuff. We can you know, give them paper and paper and paper, and, but it, wasn't really, it was not the stuff that they could truly hold the public service and the executive to account. Almost never happened. And I can go through the files. It was why we were asked to cost the war in Afghanistan by Mr. Paul Dewar. It was why, you know, when we costed fighter planes, I think, I'm sure parliamentarians never saw that kind of analysis. We would give that analysis to the prime minister, we would give it to the finance minister, minister of national defense, but never, you know, never, parliament would never see it. When we costed crime bills, same thing. Parliament never got that information. And yet they were asked to vote on legislation. You know, when the prime minister said old age security, got to change it, it's not sustainable, we're saying, well, we've done analysis on it. We're the only ones to have done analysis. It is sustainable. You can change it. No one's saying you shouldn't change it. Maybe we're spending too, many, too much money now in the future on seniors, but you don't have to change it because it's not sustainable. Change it because we want to give more money to the next generation. I could buy that. But, you know, so they never saw that information. You know, there's a quote I like from uh, uh, um, Tony Judd, a kind of a British historian. Um, and he said, he recently passed away, a very prolific man. He said, in the short run, Democracies can survive the indifference of the citizens, the so-called democratic, democratic, demographic, uh, democratic, uh, getting tired, <laughs> democratic deficit. The steady, you know, the declining turnout. You didn't get a declining turnout in the referendum. That was good. That was amazing. Good for Regina. You know, the cynical, but the cynicism, it's amazing how much cynicism we have towards politicians and um, in our, just our political institutions. Like, we, we have to deal with that issue. In the short run, Tony Judd says, you, you, can, you can survive it for a period of time. In the long run, he says, democracies, they exist only by the virtue of the engagement of citizens in the management of the public affairs. Like, you have to engage people just the way you engaged them in the referendum yesterday, you know, over the wastewater site. That's a healthy thing. But once you start getting cynical and different, you know, voter turnouts drop down 70, 60, 50 percent, below 50 percent, then we're not engaged anymore. You stop reading the newspapers, we don't care, you know, and we get turned off by what's going on in the Senate, and we just say, ah, don't worry about it, it'll be fine. And then when you look at the rest of the world, it doesn't work out that way. Now you look, what's the difference between us and a lot of countries in the Middle East? It's our institutions. You know, a lot of literature coming out now, great literature, you know, some, you know, some literature for some great economists from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, why nations fail. They say three things. Or actually, they say for why nations succeed, they are more positive. Number one, economic opportunities. You've got to make sure all the kids like in this room that were studying in journalism or economics, studying at the University of Regina, you've got to give them opportunities. Uh, number two, they say, you know, these folks, Asim McGlynn Robinson, who wrote the book Why Nations Fail, you've got to be able to hold the legis you've got to be able to hold the executive to account. Very important. You know, number three, that you've got to disperse political power, number three. And I'm so we're really struggling. And I can honestly, it's not hard for me to make the case that parliamentarians, they don't get that information. They cannot hold the government to account. Like for me, the case in point, 2012, the government goes from stimulus to austerity. So now they're freezing budgets after they've been growing at about 6% a year for, for over 10 years. And then, the, you know, the government's, you know, the government, re, they released their spring reports. There was no information on a departmental basis on where those cuts were going to take place. 
And so I started to write to deputies. And over the spring of 2012, we wrote three sets of let letters to all the deputies. I need to see your spending plans. You know, I need to provide risk analysis to parliamentarians. You know, is there fiscal risk? Will we achieve all these savings? Is there service level risk? I need to do a risk assessment. I'm the priority budget officer. They said, no, we can't give that to you. Right? How could you have any accountability when you, have, you don't have departmental spending plans consistent with the budget? Again, the budget's a high level plan. You know, Minister Goodell had written many budgets. The d details come out in the departments, and the government say, no, we're not giving you the details. And I'd say, well, you gave us the details and stimulus. Oh, yeah, but that was different. That was a minority parliament, and we were spending money. Now we're taking money away. So then I had two rounds of letters with the clerk of the Privy Council. I even met him, and he said, no, you're not getting it. Then cabinet ministers said, no, you're not getting it. You're exceeding your mandate. You shouldn't even be asking that question. How could you be the priority budget officer and say we're not going to look at austerity when we focused on stimulus? And they said, no, you're not getting it. I said, well, we, we have, the system's completely broken. There is no accountability. They're saying, you know, we, you know so there's nothing to hold them accountable to. There's no plan. And, you know, I think Canadians should know. Like, what's the impact on the Food Inspection Agency? What's the impact on Human Resources or Service Canada? You know, what is the impact? How are they going to manage? How are they going to freeze spending levels for five years? How are they going to maintain those service levels? No, I can't tell you. I won't tell you. So we went to federal court. And it was okay. It was a process. You know, we had, um, at the end of it, actually, we got the decision. It was the last two days in my office. We were in federal court. And then we got the decision afterwards. And the judge effectively said, you know what? You created the priority budget officer. You told him to do this stuff. And... Um, you know, I'm going to ask the parliamentary budget officer to go back, you know, two parliamentarians and ask him one more, to the, to the executive, ask him for that information one more time. But if he comes back to me, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to provide judgment on whether he should be getting it or not. Very effectively insinuating that he would stand up for the act of parliament. Because the, the government created this, you know, parliament created the act of parliament. Actually, they created, sorry, the parliamentary budget officer, which is, is mandated is in the act of parliament. Just a few words about the estimates process. Like, so we have this process. That's where we scrutinize those departmental spending plans. That's effectively where in the government says, no, we're not giving them to you under, under austerity. We gave, or, we gave them to you for stimulus, but not austerity. So basically, like, and we spend roughly $240, $250 billion a year of spending. You know, we have like 20 big departments and a whole bunch of agencies. It's like 90-plus organizations. You know, and you know, they do, there's thousands of programs. So literally, if you want to break them all down, they got approved by finance ministers and and the prime ministers and parliaments over many years. So we asked parliament to scrutinize them. We create standing committees, and we have these supply periods. And we can say, go away, start examining, ask the tough questions. And, um, but, you know, effectively, we give them no scope, effectively, to make changes. So, like, when you're basically told, you examine, but, you know, you can't actually, you can't change anything in the current system. Because it would be a, actually like, a, it would be a vote of confidence, a financial bill. So they can't actually do any change. Like, we know ourselves, if somebody tells us, like, you know, I'm really interested in your opinion, but I'm not really going to do anything with it. Like, there's a problem, right? Like, there's an incentive in the system. You have to give these people ability to make changes in that system. Number two, like, that process, the way they vote, you know, on, you know again, on $240, $250 billion a year, you know, like a quarter of a trillion dollars in all these departments, they vote basically on, on we call them input. So they get a big department, say, Aboriginal and Northern Affairs. And they'll vote on the operations for that whole department. They'll vote on, um, they'll vote on capital for that whole department. They don't vote on education. They don't vote on water. They don't vote on development. They don't vote on land claims. But they have to vote right across the department. These, you know, these, and they don't understand it. And you cannot actually walk the numbers through from the budget, you know, to that department. You know, those programs that are in the department to the public accounts. It's just, you know, I've been there in those departments. You have to be more than an astrophysicist. Um, there's only a handful of people that can really do it, and you kind of lose confidence in the system. And even if you're there for decades, you have a hard time walking through the numbers. You know, money's you know they don't get they don't show up in the in the estimates because you know the budget's done on an accrual basis. The estimates are done on, on uh, a cash basis, um, and uh, you know there's some stuff doesn't show up in the estimates. It's you know it's held back under special allotments. You know, you have special votes that held at Treasury Board. You cannot go from, you, know, you just cannot go, you know, you, you cannot walk through. And lastly, on the estimate system, like, it's not a level playing field, which is really the way we set up Parliament for checks and balances. 
power of the prayer is resting with members of parliament. They should need to have that information. So again, we set up the system so that it favors the prime minister. It favors the executive. So like all the power rests with them. The power of the prayer is, even though in the Constitution, the Financial Administration Act is supposed to rest with members of parliament, we give it, effectively, we change the system. We got it to the system because we made it so complicated. And all the support goes to the prime minister. All the support goes to the cabinet. And so they, and they, they decide whether they give information or not. You know, the public servants are not so keen to make providing information. You know, I'm a public servant. And, you know, we're not so keen and say, well, you know, because if I provide all this information, say we're cutting something that's difficult, my phone rings. The media is asking questions. You know, my boss is getting emails. I have to answer those emails. I have to go in front of committees and explain why we're doing, why we're cutting here and not there, or why there's a problem with that program. So they stop providing this sort of information. You know, and so the public service is just as much at fault, like myself, as, as anybody when we design these systems. You could simplify this thing so easily. Like, we could easily go in and, and create a process that incents parliamentarians to make the changes. We could change the structure of the public accounts so we vote on program activities. That big issue a few years ago when people found out that, well, we're moving money from border infrastructure funds to uh, legacy funds around Muskoka. Well, like, you know, who, is that possible? Yeah, it's actually possible because it's all done within the same vote. Make them vote on program activities. So vote on farm financial bills. You know, vote on, the, on, on ice breaking. You know, vote on, uh, you know, old age security programs. Vote on Aboriginal health and water pro, you know, you know, health and water programs, et cetera, et cetera. And then keep, you know, have the, so when we come back, if the, if the, you know, if a cabinet minister or a deputy minister wants to change the, his allotment, they have to go back to parliament. Then you have real accountability. And then lastly, make parliament, make all public servants accountable. Like make us release our work. Again, I'm, you know, in my office at the PBO, we released everything we did, everything. We wouldn't do anything confidential. We actually had to fight for that. So everything you did is on our website, still on our website, even though I haven't been there in six months. You can see all the studies right back from our very first study where we costed the Afghanistan engagement. And up to, our, you know, up to the product that got released today, it's all there. All our correspondence with deputy ministers, we need this information, here's why we need it, and their responses back, it's all there. All our, you know, our quarterly hospitality, there was almost none because I'm the cheapest guy you've ever met. And uh, it's all there. Even those expenditures are on our website. Not hard to do. Easy to do. Just show your work. So why wouldn't we ask parliament, why wouldn't we ask public servants? When I, and I was a public servant for 27 years. What are your assumptions behind your forecast? How did you estimate that, you know, the, you know, that, the impacts of that tax expenditure? You know, what did the cost if we changed the GST by a percentage point? You know, what is the cost of a universal child care program? Show us your analysis. There's nothing, there's no cabinet confidence there. It's just adding and subtracting numbers and a lot of assumptions. You know, in some parts, like in some parts of the world, like New Zealand, that's proactively released. They don't have a choice. Like they, you know, they have to release it. And I think so, you know, again, so the future, if you want to look at it, other countries do it way better than we do. We could just copy from some of these other countries. So we can clean up that estimate system. You know, again, is there any chance in the world that we're going to, in the speech from the throne this fall, that we're going to have the major priority from, from the prime ministers to change the estimate system? No. I wouldn't say zero, but it's very small. They won't change it. Why won't they change it? It doesn't serve them. It would serve parliament, it would serve Canadians, but it doesn't serve their interests. Very hard thing to do. Again, back to that quote about, it's hard to get people to change things if their salary depends on it. Just a few words about the Parliamentary Budget Office. And like to me, it was an, an experiment in fiscal transparency. It was, you know, and again, it was a job that nobody really wanted to be the Parliamentary Budget Office, including me. And everybody had their head down when they were asking in the first time. And because, uh, you know, the, in, yeah, the coffee shops just like, well, governments, they don't want more accountability. So why would you take the job? And the way the legislation was drafted, you know, this person, this Parliamentary Budget Officer, and it's still the case, works at pleasure of the Prime Minister. Like, is it the job of the Parliamentary Budget Officer to provide the pr pleasure to the Prime Minister? By pleasure means they can remove you at any time. You have one nasty report, you're gone. So what's the incentive to provide a report saying, you know, I'm really worried about fighter planes. I think, you, you know, I think we underestimated, like, big time. I'm really worried about crime bills. I think they're going to build up. And you know what? You never told the provinces they're going to have to pay even more than you guys. And, you know, so what's the incentive when you work at pleasure? There is no incentive. There's no protection in that system. And then they put the office in the Library of Parliament. 
very nice institution, but a very different business model. You know, it's just, it's a very, it's a confidential business service to members of the parliament to help them get ready for their discussions at committee, to write committee reports, very important. But it's not a legislative budget office. You know, a legislative budget office would be like the meetings Minister Goodell would have to have with other cabinet ministers. I'm sorry you're not getting this. You didn't do your homework. That's more than nature. That's more of a body contact sport. And so it's a very different, it's not a congruent kind of business model in that sense when money money's involved. So, and the other thing is the issue of transparency. Like, you know, in, you know, it's like an OECD best practice principle for legislative budget office. You've got to publish everything you do. That's what keeps you honest. That's what keeps you saying, well, you're a partisan. You know, you paid your liberal hack, you're an NDP hack, you're a Green Party hack. The only way you can fight that is say, well, look at my work. Look at our work. It's all up on our website. Where did we talk about this was, the, you know, your priorities for the country or your policy directions? We didn't say buy F-35. We didn't say change old age security. We didn't, no, we just said if you change it, here's a cost. Actually, here's a range of costs because we really can't predict the future. Nobody can predict the future. Um, so, like, they set up, the, the, to me, they set up the, the legislation to fail. They didn't want it, you know, at that point in time. And I told the kids today, the kids, sorry, I apologize. I told the students today, this is my age, I told the students that, you know, the story that I heard from Mrs. Rivlin, who set up the Congre Congressional Budget Office in the United States in the 70s, and she met Mrs. Thatcher, and she asked, you know, Mrs. Thatcher said, Mrs. R Mrs. Rivlin, like, would be, I'd love to have one of these, you know, legislative budget offices. She was in opposition at the time. And then a few years passes by in the mid, you know, some, somewhere in the early 1980s, Mrs. Rivlin meets his Mrs. Thatcher, and Mrs. Rivlin asks, like, are you going to build the budget office? She says, well, why would I do that? Like, they have the power now. Like why would I want to, you know, provide all this, you know, have this transparency, have these data points where I have to debate? It's, it's a nuisance for me to get to where I want to get to. So for us, it was like we're an experiment. We decided really early on, if we're going to do this, we just decided, you know what, we're going to be like a 21st century organization. We literally, over coffee, we decided in the summer of 2008, hadn't released a report, we decided, you know, we're going to be just an open model. We'll publish everything we do. We'll put it on a website. We decided, you know, all our major costings would be peer-reviewed. Otherwise, we, you know, the parliamentarians wouldn't think that work was authoritative. So we get people before we released it to you know, experts in the field to look over our work. And we decided, you know, we never had a big budget, so we said, you know, we'll just we'll work and we'll be a very open or we'll we'll be a very open organization. We'll go to the expertise. We didn't know anything about fighter planes. We didn't know we could do fighter planes at the time. So we'll just go find people that know something about fighter planes. You know, on the same thing on cr on crime bills. Uh, you know, we'll just go find the experts and then we'll sit down with them and we'll bring our toolbox of financial skills and we'll meet, sit down with these people and we'll work out some numbers and then we'll, you know, we'll write a paper, not a PowerPoint presentation, but a paper with, you know, with uh, details and we'll put our names on it. We'll put our names on it. Like authors will put their names on the paper. You know what? And then I work at pleasure. Everybody could hold me accountable. I was given that responsibility under the Act of Parliament to be the budget officer. You know, if I make a bad mistake, hold me accountable. The work is all there. It's all on the website. We'll put it up. Everybody gets to see it at the same time. We do nothing that's confidential. So we started that way, and we kept it that way, and it wasn't easy. Like, we had major pushback for sure. But in some ways, I look back, that was just healthy. Like, it's part of the change process. Change is never easy. And if, you know, if we're gonna push through and start pushing more transparency, that's the way you have, somebody has to start. Even if this, the process sputters and we fail. Like a former boss, my, my Alex Himmelfarb said to me, he was a clerk of the Privy Council, he said, Kevin, there's no risk-free risk. Like you cannot pretend like, okay, we're gonna do something and then there's no risk. You can't say you're gonna start a legislative budget office, you're gonna be transparent, guess what guys, you won't have to worry. Like maybe, you know, we'll all live happily ever after. Um, like we kind of knew after the first few reports, it wasn't going to get, it wasn't going to be easy. After our costing of Afghanistan, after our first economic and fiscal projections that were very different from the government, they cut my budget by a third. And then, you know, I had to whine about that. You know, I grew up in Thunder Bay, it's not popular to whine, you know, <laughs> certainly about money. Um, a lot of people don't have money. And you know it's hard to explain to people like you gave me a deal. You said I had you know so much money to to do this you know legislative mandate, provide in in par in the legislation says provide analysis on the economy, on the nation's finances, scrutiny of the estimates, costing, and they gave me a budget for it. And I said, well, okay, I'm going to work within the budget. And then they took it away. 
they didn't like the reports. And then in the summer of 2009, I found myself in front of a joint committee, a parliament basically saying I should be held in contempt of parliament. And for and I'm saying, whoa. And I said, like, how did we get so far off track? Like, all we effectively done at that point in time, released these sorts of costings on the war, economic and fiscal projections that were more accurate than the government. We did some nice work for Aboriginal folks, looking at, you know, looking at capital budgeting for schools. And our reports, see, like, these are the best reports in my 30 years, and I'm being fired. And, uh, and then I'm saying, like, where's the contempt? Like in, you know, I, and I, we actually had this issue when we went to federal court. The speakers were saying, you know, he says, you're, you're usur usurping the privileges of parliamentarians. I say, don't we want, like in the Constitution, the Financial Administration Act says the power of the purse rests with the House of Commons. Don't we want to give them information? You know, you create a change. And then actually, it was just, I found that was just an amazing debate. And, honest, and then I came back when they released that report. They said everything I had to do with was confidential. It was a unanimous committee report. Not an easy report. I honestly wanted to quit that day. I, I just thought I had like no clients, and it was really the people in my office that no, we can't quit. This is like more important. So they said no, you have to stick it through, keep getting products out the door, and you know, and we'll figure out a way how to get around the confidentiality, which we did actually. And you know, and people helped. You know, the media helped. They were very supportive in the sense that they paid attention. Like a lot of people, when I first took the job, and I said this to the journalism students this morning. A cabinet minister said to me, no one's going to be interested in what you do. No one, maybe three people. And I swear to God, it's a direct quote. Like one chief economist, you know, works for the, you know, the Liberal Party. You know, maybe one senator, conservative senator. He likes geeky stuff. Other than that, nobody's going to be interested. And I'm saying to myself, well, after 27 years working at finance, the Privy Council office, costing all these things, how could they not be interesting? They've never seen this stuff. You know, not knowing even at that time we would be costing fighter planes and ships and crime bills, et cetera, et cetera. And, but I think actually, so this is really more of the message to the students. Like, actually, you know, the power of the pen, it's pretty strong. It's very strong. If you do the analysis, if you do the homework, just like the, the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives, you put that information together, you put it out, you speak to people. Like, you don't hide, you don't duck. You can actually have a pretty significant impact. You know, some people argue, like, I don't have a job. Like I was unemployed in April, so maybe it had no impact. And some people said, like, maybe, you, you know, did you play it wrong? Like, did you come out too strong? Would you have done it differently? Maybe you should have eased in on the whole transparency thing. You know, and you know, again, more advice. Like to me, back early on, we got advice from, from a fellow from the OECD. He said, Kevin, cement dries quickly. You know, and, you know, and you know, being from Thunder Bay, I understood that. And so, like he said, like, if you're going to be like a transparent office, you have to be transparent on your first report. Like, if you're going to be an analytical office, you've got to be analytical on your first report. Like, and so, like, you, 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 there's no, like, there's no, you know, if you're going to speak, you know, like, so-called truthiness, like, you can, it always has to be there. Like, you can't say, oh, I'm going to do it now, not, not on this file, but not on that file. So, that became part of the big part of the process. That kind of let consistency cementarize quickly. So, you know, our point of view is like we tried to build the budget office, a great experience. It was an experiment. What happens if you give parliamentarians information? Well, look at F35. I think it does make an impact. You know, and, um, you know, and so we, and we wanted to be there as well on, on the austerity issues, on old age security issues. I think you can. If you give that information to parliamentarians, it's not the parliamentary budget officer. They can take that information. You know, they can say, you know what? Okay, we just had a war in Afghanistan. We lost, you know, we, we sent tens of billions of dollars of capital. What kind of military do we want after that war? They can debate that now. You know, what, you know, we had 25, 30,000 troops, or, you know, individual soldiers go to Afghanistan. What's the cost of death and disability after that? You know, and so that's a significant issue. And then we did, like, on Aboriginal educational infrastructure, and you know, we basically looked at the model, and, you know, and we said to ourselves, like, why wouldn't we cost Aboriginal educational in infrastructure the same way we do for, for primary schools and secondary schools? Like, m the schools that my kids, why, why would we do something different for them? And we actually put the same model together. We're underfunding about 100 million a year for Aboriginal people. Same model. And you know, we did get data from, you know, from a deputy minister. And um, you know, if the prime minister says like, old age security is not sustainable because we have increases in, 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 in the number of, of recipients and it's going to continue to increase, 
like I think the, like he should explain to people that, like, you know, what that really means. And, you know, because when we did the analysis, like, we, you know, it's easy to see that the number of recipients has gone up by millions since I joined the public service in 1981. And it will go up in millions over the next few years. It's a program that's funded by general revenues. So actually, when we did the analysis, you know, and the actuary does the analysis, it is sustainable. It doesn't mean you shouldn't change it, but you can have a debate. So I think on every one of these, on fighter planes, when we costed fighter planes, you know, and we would do all the work on the fighter planes, like, you know, you know it's, so if you, if, if you tell somebody you can get a fighter plane for $75 million, then, yeah, go ahead. You know, that fighter plane, you get a stealth fighter plane, fifth generation, get it, but you ain't going to get it for $75 million. Like, the Americans are already budgeting, and you can't get you know, much higher numbers than that. And you're not going to get it cheaper than the Americans. They build them. Why would they sell them to Canadians for less than they're, and, you know, it just, it's, their laws prevent them from doing that. So every one of these issues, again, and then you could raise the issues, like, do we really, like, do we want to spend 30 or $45 billion for a fighter plane over, over life cycle? You know, do we need a fifth generation stealthy fighter plane? Are we going to be strike fighters? Are we going to be the ones that go in to Syria, you know, on the first wave? Is that, you know, you could have a different conversation. So if financial people, even though, with you know information, they don't set the priorities, they don't set the policy directions, but they can impact the debate. So I think that the cabinet minister was wrong. And so information does matter, and if you give parliamentarians that information, they can make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, I think there's a few things to talk about. Um, I was trying to live tweet this and my thumbs are really, really sore now. Um, there's just a lot there. Uh, gonna give Kevin a minute to gather his thoughts. We have two microphones, one on each side. Come, I'm gonna moderate the question period. Uh, I'm sure there are lots of questions, but before we get the first question, Cheryl's gonna come up from the CCPA and say a few words. Hello, thank you, Kevin, and uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, welcome, everyone, to this event. Um, if you're not quite sure, I think most people know what the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives is, but I just want to take a, just a couple of moments to, just to talk about the, the CCPA in Saskatchewan. So uh, it is a national organization, a research and policy uh, think tank, if you like, and it's created kind of as a counterweight to some of the the more conservative right-wing think tanks like the Fraser Institute, uh, the Canada West Foundation and such. And it's really, really critical, as you heard um, our guest speaker Kevin talk tonight about having information and how important it is to have alternative information than what we normally see in the media and um, through, through research organizations. In Saskatchewan, and now at the, there is a table there, and you might have seen this. Simon has put together this great little prospectus that kind of outlines the work of CCPA, example of some of the research that's been done over the last number of years. And it includes um, uh, a really great three-part series on, on the environment that Peter Preble and Mark Bigland Pritchard worked on that talked about how our energy use is in the, in, the, in the province and what a possible alternative strategy would be for renewable energy. Um, there's been stuff, um, a good report done on liquor privatization that made a lot of headlines nationally as well as provincially. Um, a paper on university affordability, papers on labor law changes, quite a wide range of, of, of documents. They are available on our website, um, so do go there as well. In terms of upcoming work, right now, uh, Simon and uh, retired professor Paul Gingrich have been working on a living wage study, which is uh, going to be a real critical, I think we've never had that, that kind of an assessment of, we know what the minimum wage is, but what would be a, a, a living wage in the province? And as the province, the, the new labor legislation is gonna be basically freezing minimum wage and then indexing it from that, that point, I think it's gonna be important to talk about what is a living wage. 
and there's also some work being done, I think, on a prison justice study. So your support is, is like very, a very of fear important. In Ottawa right now, so there is, a, you know, I think a lot of public servants are worried about if they speak out. You know, science, you hear, you read about it about scientists as an example, and you, know, you don't see, you know, you don't see a lot of studies like we used to see on websites from, you know, from various departments. I think, I think what I was very, very fortunate was able to, you know, people came, some of these people self-selected to come to this office, and their view, like they looked at. Uh, they looked at you know job security in a different way. So if, for them, you know, and, like, and they looked at job security in the context of if I'm not doing my, you know, if I'm not doing this work, if I'm not working on really important, relevant issues, then my skills are going to erode. So I need to get to a place where I can just I could do the work, and I, in a very positive environment, I can get the cover that I need to do the, to do the work, get you know access to the expertise that I need. Then my skills get better. So that's the real job security, is not like you know, there may be some short-term pressure, in you know, in from coming from a deputy minister or some department may be reluctant to hire me. Where it was like, what if what if my skills continue to erode? And so when they came and they were, you know, they immediately we started building models to do economic and fiscal projections, and people are costing wars and building capital budget models for infrastructure. People are using these parametric models to cost fighter planes and ships. And then they're doing sustainability analysis, like we released today. And everybody said, "Whoa, I'm learning a lot. Like this is fun. I just want to keep doing this." And so this is like real public service. And instead, and in the context, most of these people had worked at finance, and treasury, and PCO, and they're saying, "Now I get to make it available to everybody." And when people call, I just answer. I pick up the phone and I answer their questions. Like what a great model. <laughs> like it's, just, you know. And then you know. And that members of parliament can call, and, and you know the media can call if they answer, you know, if they are asking questions about the report. And uh, Canadians call all the time. They call. They send emails, and you know, it was a busy place. Wow, it's just like a fun place to work. And I think the problem now is like once they get a taste of it, they don't want to go back to you know I can't talk to this person because I was told not to talk to this person or I can't do this kind of research because it might not be consistent with, you know, with the communications coming out of the Prime Minister's office. It would be very hard to go back. Like this kind of, it, is, it was very enlightening for all of us. So, yeah, and then, you know, sometimes I often felt like in terms of accountability when something goes wrong, that sometimes the people, you know, some people took too much, you know, ended up too much on their shoulders. But I would also say the extent that PBO was successful was not because of me. It was because like the people that actually did the work, like the heavy lifting, doing the analysis, working with people in Canada, other parts of countries, writing the papers, and even having the courage to put their names on papers, and having the courage to go to like committees to sit at the front of the committees with me and, and like on F-35 or crime bills, um, and you know, and to, and to actually to exchange with members of parliament. But what a great job! You know, so why you, you wouldn't want to turn it down? And like you know, we said to the you know, I said to the students today, Mrs. Roosevelt said that you know you're not really living until you're living outside your comfort zone, and we all kind of felt it. But it was a yeah, great experience. So what is fear really? Go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you tonight for a great presentation. I appreciate it very much. Uh, I just wanted to comment a bit on. Uh, you mentioned earlier in your speech that you were. Uh, a concern when voter turnout uh, started dropping below 50, and I unfortunately don't share quite the same enthusiasm with our referendum here because we only ended up with 31% yeah. of eligible voters that uh, came out. And I'm just, uh, I worked on the campaign with Regina Waterwatch on the yes side for seven months, and I talked to thousands of citizens uh, during that time, and I ran into a lot of uh, apathy yeah. and cynicism out there, and I was just curious. Uh, on, I guess, uh, your opinion on how we can overcome that uh, cynicism, and cynicism and apathy that uh, seems to be quite prevalent uh, with populations today? Yeah. yeah. I mean, first, and I hope you feel very proud of the work that you did, like on the referendum. Yeah, and because um, if it wasn't for people like you and others, that I don't think you would have had the turnout that you had. And uh, that is what civic engagement is all like. I don't think it's necessarily a win or a loss, but it's, it's people like you that get people activated, that knock on people's doors, that say, you know, pay attention. You know, maybe as a result, they read the article and is it the prairie dog, 
you know, that I was just looking at on the issue that, you know, it just encourages that. So I think that to me, yeah, I think congratulations. And you may, you know, again, you may not get the result, but I think it's, it's the way you approached it and it's the way you played it. So, I mean, what do we do with apathy and uh, indifference and what I, some people call willful blindness? Like people know, like on some of these big issues, like I mean, it could be climate change issues or some foreign affairs issues. We know we're doing stuff that's wrong, but we just stick our heads in the sand and just pretend that, you know, it's going to get better somehow. I just don't want to look at it. And... Um, like, I think like that's why this, this university plays such an important role, and um, that's why you know the, we education, you know, and, and getting like having this opportunity to speak to the journalism students today that are very engaged, and it you know, plays such a big role. Can you turn this around? Well, we certainly can't turn it around without you. Like you have to do, and you have to do, you know, and others that have you know, participated in that just have to feel good about that. That is the way it's supposed to be done. Yeah, so maybe a third, you maybe you would have liked higher, maybe you would have liked in different you know, numbers in terms of the split of the vote. Boy, but you know, I, I just know from what I heard today, I knew nothing about that issue coming from Ottawa. I heard about it all day long, and I read about it. So like, you did something. Yeah, you raised the bar. <laughs> they were clapping for you. And you, because you were working on this too. And probably a whole bunch of people too, right? <laughs> I just want to thank you first for your presentation. It was really fantastic, and we really appreciate you coming out tonight. Um, my question is actually about uh, the resources available to scientists and researchers right now. As you know, the Harper government has really scaled back on what is available. And for full disclosure, I'm a PhD student here, so it's an area of concern for me. Um, I wanted to know your insight on this issue and uh, what advice you would have for researchers and future researchers trying to get the information that we need to give to policymakers to make informed decisions. Yeah, like, I, like for me, when I said early on that I think like 2000, you know, this fall in the speech on the throne and the debate about priorities in the election coming in 2015, they're just opportunities. And I think, you know, one of the things I learned, unfortunately, some from personal life, some from professional life, but professionally at PBO, you learn, like, as Einstein saying, you want to look at difficulties or challenges and see the opportunities. And um, so, like, for me, like, at, you know, at PBO, they cut our budget. So we would sit back and say, okay, how do we turn this into an opportunity? Or do we just sort of walk, pick up our bags and go? And so we decided, like, you know what? Yours truly is going to whine about it. And we're going to explain to people that, you know, there was a deal that was made, you know, with the priority budget officer that, you know, he, you know, that, you know, that a certain amount of financial due diligence. So I used it as an opportunity to explain and actually to explain, like, the pressures that are in the system and why you actually need the legislative need, needed to change. Like, if you want dissonance, like, if, you were, if we're afraid, if we're, you know, if we want to have debate, then you've got to protect it. You want auditor general, generals to be protected, et cetera. So, like, for scientists... Like, what a great opportunity. You know, we have our, our speech on the throne. And to come out in this sort of discussion, you're an opposition party to say, this is not tolerable. It's not my country. I don't recognize it. You know, we have, you know, science, you know, whether it's in the Arctic or in fresh waters or, you know, an agricultural science or whatever the science is, they need to be going to conferences. They need to be speaking out. We're going to, you know, we're going to be something different. So to actually to change the script, change the channel. To me, that's an opportunity like just start to say now that 2015 is going to be different if you don't like it. Um, I don't know, does anybody like it? <laughs> I wouldn't think you'd show up to this meeting if you kind of were okay, ah, those damn scientists, what do they know? <laughs> yeah. you know? I just don't, yeah. So I think there's a lot of people out here. Like, and when you do the math, like, you know, you look at the popular vote and how many people showed up, it doesn't take much to change the script, you know, and, but the thing is start the debate now. And actually, for me, it's not, it's, it, for us, it, it was like at PBO, it wasn't interesting enough to say, you know what, you cut my budget, and, or, you know, or um, you're, making, you're making it difficult for me to release documents. I think you have to say, like, you know, you have to tell people that this is what you're going to do, um, you know, with that transparency. If you're going to make scientists, you know, be able to release their studies, like, where is your focus on science going to be? 
and then you create the momentum for you know for like you know a renewal of science you know over the next little while and spending perhaps more you know investing more money you know even taxpayer money on you know when we look at the allocation of money on science so it's not enough just to say we're going to be different but tell people how are you going to be different and uh, the great opportunity so I think there is huge opportunities to change things around. It could be done quickly with the right leadership. Sir. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any instruments when you're doing budgeting to look at the value of the public good. Now, in full disclosure, I'm a farmer, so this is a slightly biased question, but I look at the cuts that are being made to the agricultural department in terms of public plant breeding, uh, the closing of our prairie pasture programs and the shuttering of the massive financial black hole that was the Indian Head Tree Nurseries. Yeah. Uh, do, do parliamentarians or uh, the new parliamentary budget officer, do they have the ability to weigh the public good of something as public plant breeding versus a private sector model in terms of saying, well, you know, it's not a dollars and cents thing, but it does offer this to it. And uh, the second question I would have is, in your time in the office, did the Canadian Wheat Board come across your desk at any time? And uh, <laughs> what experience would you, uh, did you have, if any, with that? Thank yeah. you. Well, I think on the issue of, uh, you know, uh, value, of, you know, of, of, of sh the in you know, comparing, you know, one program to another program, different ways of, of doing things, like what can, uh, economists and financial analysts bring to the table to support Parliament in those kinds of discussions. I mean, first, like we felt, actually, we had, you know, in our in our organization, we spent time right at the beginning saying, like, what is our mission? And our mission for us was that we're just, you know, whatever we do, we just want to be promote transparency, and we want to get really excited when 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 uh, members of Parliament use financial analysis when you know when they're making decisions, and so that was our mission. And so for us, when, you know, we, in 2012, when the cutting started, and we're, you know, we need to get back to balance, you know, we did analysis on what the impacts of the cuts would be overall, like just from a macro perspective. And then, you know, because we couldn't generate a plan ourselves, we, you know, we couldn't look at the risk around the plan, risk to service levels, that, you know, really the impacts that you're referring to, sir, you know, on, on, far, on the farming community, on Canadians as a result. Like, you know, uh, we basically said, we got a problem. Like we, you know, we, you know, Parliament we cannot get this information. So that again, in the budgeting, it deals with how you're allocating your money, and you know, across you know farming programs, other programs. So we never got the plan, and uh, you know, we argued for over a year to say like, where are those cuts happening? And then, so like, in my view is, again, going back to you know, we we know, and because I, I was involved as a public servant developing these reviews of departments. Like, they, you know, before the, you know, the department, you know, at some point in time would have had to gone to the prime minister's office and, and the cabinet and said, here's our, here's our package of cuts. You're telling us that you need to find 50 million, say whatever, on agriculture or basis, you know, whatever it is, one and a half billion dollars, and here's where we're making your cuts. We're getting rid of environmental programs and other programs. Like, and, then, and then they would have to justify what their priorities were, where were the efficiency programs, why did you choose those? Like, to me, a lot of that work could actually be made available to all parliamentarians at a standing committee. And deputy ministers could be brought in and could explain with evaluations on their programs, here's the evidence that I used to decide that on this cut vis-a-vis -vis that cut. At the end of the day, the parliamentarian has to explain that he made the choice. But I think the analysis, the evaluations that would have been done in these programs are done effectively by public servants, and that should have been released. It was never released. So as the budget officer, you can't pick to say, you know, I'm going to look at the wheat board. I was never asked to look at the wheat board. And you can't pick to say, I'm going to focus on agriculture. I worked at agriculture. I worked in farm financial programs for a few years. Um, those requests come from parliamentarians. But it, we were enough to say that we knew like, there was systemic failure in the system when the government was saying, we're not giving you any plans. We're not telling you where the cuts are. And, and then you effectively you took parliament right out of the game. And um, so that's basically why we went to federal court. And I didn't, as I said earlier today, I didn't get invited to any cocktail parties uh, from any deputy ministers after we did that. Hello. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks very much for your presentation tonight. 
Um, when you brought it up earlier, uh, you mentioned climate change, and, and when the farmer asked about the wheat board, I wondered if you'd come across anything in specific to climate change or uh, oil policy and, and what it's costing uh, Canadians right now. Yeah, we uh, it was that'd be a great issue. Actually, maybe a good issue for my my new endeavor, which is to try to create an uh, I'm in the process of trying to create an institute of public finance at the University of Ottawa. And um, I think you know, the president at the university feels that you know we need to do invest more of that you know time and energy at those sorts of issues. So we didn't do it while I was the priority budget officer, but I wouldn't certainly rule it out to do climate change. I'd love to do climate change, really environmental work at the Institute of Public Fiscal Studies at the University of Ottawa, which needs to be created. Uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, you and your office were a light in a very dark uh, time in these last five, six years, as far as I'm concerned. You can. Just like to pick up a couple of things. I saw written in stone 30 years ago in Minneapolis this quote, and I, I think it picks up what you were saying earlier in the lecture. It is this. A democracy depends on the active participation of the citizens. Yeah. I have never forgotten that, and I've tried to shape my life, like in this last uh, Water Watch campaign, participating. But when you have a government, the Stephen Harper government, is how he likes to have it called, I believe, uh, which is so dictatorial, which so shuts down facts, shuts down uh, uh, participation of the citizens. One gets kind of weary. Uh, so that right after this lecture, <clears throat> I'm going down to the Regina Public Library because there is a documentary which talks about him and the Bush era, and it's called Greedy Lying Bastards. But the question uh, about the F-35s, uh, how could uh, you sustain the energy to keep presenting these facts and the ministers of defense getting up and say, no, 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 no. Again, just lying to us all. Uh, or, or Clement and Baird, we took the 50 million that was supposed to be for easing uh, uh, the... Um, transportation issues at the border, and we put up a bathroom at a hockey rink, and hey, no problems. As citizens who are seeking to participate and do our job, just as many parliamentarians, how do you react to that? I just don't know. Yeah. Well, I think you, you have reacted. And um, like I, I, I agree with you, you sound like somebody that is very engaged and very informed. So I think you, you, you're not the issue. I think it's it's, the, it's some of the rest of us that have been less participated, you know, haven't participated at the same level as you have. Like, I think for us as well, like you know, like public servants have a role to play. I had a role to play, and um, to you know to do the analysis that we did, whether you know it's on those you know those, like fighter planes, and um, to be honest, how it felt. Uh, it felt it, it felt pretty scary, like when we did the, you know when we first came out with our, our study. I knew that, you know the government had released like one sheet of paper, and said we can get these fighter planes for sixteen billion dollars, and um, so then we did like a study and I don't know what it was fifty seventy five pages and we got it peer reviewed by people in the United States, uh, and in Canada, and the numbers were so different. And, and you know we were using a, a model from a, a UK, United a UK company that was helping us do this work. And again, we kept going back peer review, going back to make sure are these numbers like in the ballpark. And I remember it was one of the a really lonely time. And uh, I actually remember getting a call from a member of parliament the, the night before. I was in my office, and he said, "Kevin, it's not going to be an easy day for you tomorrow." Releasing that paper, and then we got blasted. And um, and I remember, like, the, but I remembered as well, like, we felt comfortable with the work. Like, we thought it was very good work. And, uh, but then I remember, like, honestly, every year I go to Cuba at a certain time with another family that we, well, we, lost, we lost a child. This other family lost a child. We disappear for one week. And I got a call. And uh, we were literally, like, you know, on the beach doing probably drinking or something, you know, <laughs> maybe smoking a cigar or something. And I got a call. And, you know, it was the AG report came out. 
And the Auditor General report basically said that, you know, the military officials and bureaucrats, effectively worked for the Department of National Defense, went to cabinet with numbers that were bigger than our numbers. So, you know, they, and again, I had worked in that system on, you know, in Langevin and taking, you know, I'd be one of those people that would write notes to the prime minister saying, you know, this looks good, this doesn't look good, or some version of that, and you should approve this. And once they were approved by cabinet, you know, I would write these recommend, you know, these, you know, these records and stuff. So that was all known. You know, that, you know, D&D officials, even though they were blasting us for saying, you know, we are, our estimates were grossly exaggerated, while they were doing that, they knew that they had, they went to the prime minister to get decision support with numbers that were bigger than ours. And I said, holy smokes. I can't say it felt good, but it was, it, it just felt like a bit of, there was a bit of a release that, um, I mean, again, it's the importance of an auditor general. And actually, the importance of a, a priority budget office who does the work at the front end, and Auditor General gets to come in at the, you know, basically look at the process, or actually even look at, you know, after the money is spent. And you know, a few years from now, people, an Auditor General is going to look at the, the wastewater facility. Did the P3 work? Did they get the savings they expected? And that's why. But you know, again, you want it's like the center policy alternatives or whatever, or a legislative budget officer to come in before and provide all the information you can to stimulate that debate. Thank you. Well, thanks again for coming to Regen. I really appreciate the talk. It's the easiest place to come to. Yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Thunder Bay. Like, this is heaven. <laughs> this is heaven. Yeah. And uh, I guess I really appreciated what you mentioned about transparency and accountability, especially from the public service, and we should expect that. So I guess I was just wondering what advice you would have for bureaucrats perhaps that do struggle with that and how to perhaps bring some of that transparency and accountability from within. Um, what would be kind of the path to help get that uh, greater accountability into the system? Yeah. Well, it, um, a few weeks ago I was asked to speak at a, at a public service event in Montreal and I think it was like an IPAC event. There's like 500 people there and there are deputy ministers there and they wanted me to speak about public service renewal. And I have to tell you, like that really got me anxious to just to speak to public servants about public service renewal. And because I didn't feel, I felt like, they, wow, we really needed renewal, like in a big, in her, sooner rather than later. And so I basically went and read, you know, the, you know, the clerk of the Privy Council's office blueprint for renewal. And it said things like, we want to modernize our workplace. I said, yeah, well, I, everybody wants to modernize their workplace. Uh, and then, you know, and it, there were other, a few other things, uh, you know, become more efficient, et cetera, like that. And I said, you know, I basically read it and said, like, that's not a recipe for renewal. So then I went to their, their values, which I said, you know, values are something like, you know, most people, like, even looking at this room, they don't really change. You know, the world changes, but hopefully you can keep the same values. So I read through the values of the, you know, public service charter passed in 2012, and it had things like accountability and transparency on it. You know, it had other things, you know, on it about, you know, being honest and professional, doing good, at providing good advice. But on that issue, so I told, I had, like, no problems telling 500 people, like, you did not do that on accountability and transparency. Like, and there were, and I gave them the examples. And I think until, like, you actually get to the point and just feel comfortable, like, these are not evil people. But you're not, you know, and you, you know the, the, the clerk's recipe is not a recipe for renewal. Like, we got big problems to fix. And transparency is, is one of them, doing the work, the analysis, making it available to all Canadians so they can see, so they can be held accountable. And I think uh, that is a recipe for renewal. And you know what? You can't get bright students to come to work in the public service and then tell them you, you can't do the work. You know, all these issues that we're talking about here today, they want to do the work. They, get in, they want to be motivated to do the work. They want to be inspired to do the work. So. Um, yeah, there's a huge opportunity to do, to do renewal in the public service. And how does it happen? I, I effectively also said I didn't think it was going to happen with the current leadership. Again, I get no inv invites for, for cocktail parties. And uh, no trouble. You know, and I like these people. I, you know, I played hockey with some of these deputy ministers. They don't ask me to play hockey anymore with them. Uh, I would even prefer to play hockey with them even more now. Uh, you know, and... and but you know, they're you know, and they're nice people, and they're they're under pressure, 
you know, and I said to them, you know, I said, I don't think you, you know, you know, when you're thinking about renewal, like you should be thinking 10 years ahead, five years ahead, what the world's going to look like. Like 10 years ago, we should be thinking about what if we ran into a government that's very ideological and a government that wasn't going to share information? How are you going to respond? How do you maintain your values? Again, that was a question we never really anticipated. It seemed like an, an unknown at that time. But it's not really an unknown. It's not a bad thing to have ideology. But it is a bad thing to say, you know what? I'm, I'm, not, I'm, going to be, I'm going to ignore all the facts. You know, I'm going to make it difficult to get facts out. That is not a good thing. So, I mean, I think public servants, they have to stand up. There has to be, you know, I think it really, I have more faith in the current generation of students that are at the University of Regina that are going to come in and take over these public service jobs, and they're going to make that change happen. That's why you never, get, I can never turn down an opportunity to be here or work at the University of Ottawa. Like, I do have faith in that generation. But I'm actually really disappointed at my generation for passing off the institutions and the shape that they're in right now. And, and the fact that we're not dealing with some of these long. I'm just, I'm disappointed in myself that we didn't do more. Sir. Uh, Mr. Page, uh, your, uh, your tenure as uh, Parliamentary Budget Officer uh, has uh, been a remarkable period of, uh, of uh, professionalism and, and courage uh, that is truly admired by, by the vast majority of Canadians, and I think those who are no longer inviting you to cocktail parties uh, are really uh, the losers in that endeavor. Uh, there are a lot of ordinary Canadians who would dearly love to have you at, uh, at their parties. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, don't, don't feel left out. Um, I think your work has given parliamentary democracy in this country an opportunity to save itself. And I hope in the period immediately ahead it will take that opportunity. Um, one thing I would like to ask you to do, if you could, in, in just a few moments, is some comparison, com some comparison between the PBO operation which you set up, granted within a legislative framework that was deficient uh, and wasn't what it was promised to you that it would be. Uh, but you set up the, uh, the concept in, in Canada uh, as well as you could. Um, and it did remarkable work and hopefully will continue to do so. How does that compare, the model in Canada, with the Congressional Budget Office in the United States? And would you say the system you were trying to build in Canada was superior to the one in, uh, in the U.S. Congress? Or are there some things from the congressional model that we could usefully import into the Canadian system to make our system better, more transparent, and more useful to parliamentarians who would like to have the power of the purse restored to the elected representatives of the people? Thank you. Thank you so much for your kind words. We, um Actually, before we released any, any product, I went to the United States, and I went to see you know, the directors and assistant directors of the Congressional Budget Office, and they actually reached out, and they said, well, what a, this is fantastic for Canada. We're so happy. And I remember this fellow, his name was Bob Sunshine. He was the deputy director. He, see, he was there right at the very beginning in, the, in 75 or when they created the Congressional Budget Office. He'd been around there ever since. I've met him on many occasions subsequently. But I remember he said three things to me. He said, Kevin, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. And I, and I like it when people do that. And he said, you know, number one, you got to do quality work. Because, you know, your first bad project, you're going to be in trouble. And it's going to be really hard to get your reputation back. So you, oh, your work has to be of high quality. So, like, he was helping us do peer review. Like, we'll help you out on projects. If you phone us, we'll give you help on how to do fiscal sustainability work, et cetera, et cetera. Like a really nice, open man. Number two, he said, you're going to have to learn how to communicate. And he said, just, you know, just be yourself. You know, this good message to all the students. Don't have to be anybody but yourself. Just, you know, explain things. Because some of the stuff that we do, you're costing fighter planes. Or, you know, we built complicated models looking at our prison system to cost crime bills. You just have to find a way to speak to all people. Speak to academics, but speak to members of parliament. Speak to Canadians. Speak to young kids. Speak to old kids. Just learn how to do that. Don't be afraid of doing that. And then the third thing he said to me, he said, you're going to have to be tough. He says, because they're going to try to fire you. And I said, whoa. Like I hadn't even, you know, I've been doing the job for two months. And 
you know, he says, you know, have any, we, have, we barely started working on any project. And he says, yeah, they're going to try to fire you. And then he was, like, right on everything. And so, like, very wise man. He'd been there, you know, you know, one of these people that stayed in the institution, highly regarded, respected by all people. And, um, you know, so they would share their advice and, like, how to release documents, you know, how to put together some of these documents. We had, you know, easy access. Like, it was easier. Like, you know, if we had a problem, we would almost phone them as before we'd phone a federal department to get information. You know, some, in some cases, because we did a lot of military procurement work, and it was just, they do so much of that, it was easier to do. But I think I was always impressed with that office, just the quality of the work they did. Like, you're re reading their documents. Way back, I used to forecast the U.S. economy when I was at the Department of Finance in the 80s, and this, they did good work, and they had really good staff. And, you could, and I remember going in different buildings in the United States. I'd walk into their building, and you know how it's like, like there's energy in the room. You know, the analysts were talking, and everybody's happy, and they're comparing notes. And then I go, like, I'd walk down the road, go to the general accountability office, and there's, like, nobody in the room, and it's, like, it's really quiet, and no one's talking. And then I'd walk down the road, and I would go to the office of management and budget, and the same thing. Everybody's, you know, kind of uptight, and kind of, there's not a lot of sharing of information. So they created this nice atmosphere. And I remember, like, you know, once I found myself, like, around these former directors of the Congressional Budget Office, and they were, like, giggling, and they're talking about all the stories. Oh, yeah, I remember when Nixon did this, and then Carter did this. And, and I'm saying, whoa, I would love to be part of, like, in the middle of those debates, you know, and just to have that experience kind of rub off. To, and, again, like, you don't, it doesn't rub off unless you put yourself out in harm's way, like you take on those big projects. So he was basically telling us that if you want to be relevant, you've got to be working on the big files. And Mr. Sunshine was, even though he was like 65, he was working on Obama's health care package. He was like in charge of the Congressional Budget Office. He was under major heat. But he took the time out and said, you know, I've got to speak to this guy. Never forgot that, those simple things, those gestures. Um, but there's actually right now, like I hosted in, in, I think, February of this year, like 22 countries, legislative budget offices, OECD asked Canada to host, you know, and including the United States was, you know, visited us, the Office of Budget Responsibility from the UK, Australia. Next week I'm going to the Slovak Republic. You know, I'm, I sit on their advisory panel uh, for their legislative budget office. Two weeks after that I go to South Korea, I'm on, you know, to actually, they got a big budget office, and they've asked, and we talk about fiscal sustainability, like really boring stuff, right? And, but, you know, we share notes and all these sort of stuff, I and mean, we get together as a community. So they actually always they put together principles. So we basically, you know, on a legislative budget office, you know, who you hire, how you release products, you know, how you manage your resources, how you pick projects, and we follow that. That's our guidebook for us. And so, in, um, you know, I think it's like it's like a world community now to try to strengthen institutions because it's not just a Canadian issue. Like God knows, like you could, you know, watch CNN or read the New York Times in the morning, you know, you know Google up something. It's uh, other institutions are struggling as well, but there is a cost to weak institutions, and uh, we don't. So, I, and I think uh, Mr. Goodell's right. I don't, we don't want to get any. We don't want to get weaker. We need to get stronger. So, but yeah, we just, we, we, like, we basically, in some ways, plagiarized everything. Like, you know, we didn't steal their forecast, but we said, like, how do you do fiscal sustainability? So, well, here, we'll help you out. Like, how do you estimate fighter planes? We'll help you out. Like, how do you estimate ships? We'll help you out. And then, you know, I, we started working with public servants, and you watch these public servants, all of a sudden, they're, like, they're energized. You know, we get these, like, oh, this is going to be important. Like, our first project, we're going to cost the war. And then you, once you start, you build confidence over, over time. And that's just, it's fun to do that, you know? And then again, it's, it gets, but it's still writing papers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but it's that process of, yeah, and that's the fun part, you know? It's just, it's just amazing to do that. So like for the students that are here today, to get yourself, you know, working, get your chance to meet, you know, these sorts of people that can help, that you can learn from, and not be afraid to take on those projects, boy, they can go a long way. Hi there. You Hi. mentioned in, uh, investing money in Aboriginal health and water programs, but those are treaty rights. So I'm just wondering why money would be invested in specific programs that aim to meet those inherent rights of Aboriginal peoples. Yeah, I, mean, I think the government, um, we, you know, we have, the government has 
uh, vote, a grant and contribution vote. It's probably in the neighborhood of $8 billion, split up with all sorts of things, economic development, health, uh, education, water. I don't know what our spending right now is. I'm probably in the neighborhood of a few hundred million a year on, 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 on water programs that's transferred um, to Aboriginal communities. I mean, I'm not sure if I understand your point. Like, for us, we don't question like you know, is there you know, is this you know, where's the legislative authority to do this? We have we are you know, the government is doing this now. Is that your point? Like maybe we shouldn't be doing this. We should be f finding different rela relationships with Aboriginal peoples, and we should be transferring these sorts of resources to Aboriginal people. I just mean like, is it because of the complexities involved in achieving, keeping the promises? Like, is it seems kind of like a baby step process, like bit by bit, you know, putting money towards water putting money towards education, health. Like it seems like possibly a gradual process. Would yeah. you call it something like that? Yeah, could you transition to a very different world where actually Aboriginal people are providing like their own, you know, their own health and water kind of resources? But again, these are public goods for the most part. I mean, the big debate that went on in the referendum yesterday was a water issue. We tend to treat these as public goods. Like everybody should have access to... Uh, to to you know, to to water and should have access to good healthcare programs. Like I mean, just as a Canadian citizen, until like we can get you know, if we can improve governance relations, that would be great. But I don't, like I, I don't have um, personally have a problem with us like transferring money to Aboriginal people so they have good health, good water, good educational uh, facilities. Right. I'd rather them have better, especially in a point in time we have a young, as everybody knows, a very young Aboriginal population in this country. Would you say that's like the first step in achieving, keeping these promises? Like making programs that are specific to certain things that are their rights? Well, I think, I mean, if, if, if there's different programs, there's programs on, on land rights and, you know, where there's, again, commitments that we have to Aboriginal people for basic public services. Um, I mean, as your point is that we should, re we should rethink that in a kind of a 21st century world. We should have a different split of resources. Um, as a budget officer, that was never my mandate, you know, to, to question that stuff. If, um, if somebody asked me, you know, again, back to the educational, educational issue where we did, we did do work, um, you know, basically, do we have a model in place? You know, if we're responsible for, for, for education for Aboriginal people on reserve, and we have these facilities, and we have 800 structures. We spend like two billion plus on post-secondary education for Aboriginal people. And I, I, you know, is it? I think I was very comfortable looking at that and then comparing it with what, what exists in the provinces, you know, that they provide. So it, that benchmarking work wasn't like a problem for us to do. I was comfortable doing that. But making questions on should we be spending more or less? I think I think I, I'd be happy if if parliamentarians voted on specific for Aboriginal people, they voted on economic development programs as a vote, that they voted on health and water programs as a vote, they voted on education as a vote. So that, you know, and what often happens in times of stress and budgets are being cut back is that deputy ministers and cabinet ministers are making decisions and nobody sees it. Because all those programs, health and water, economic development, they're all lumped into one big grant and contribution vote that's worth about $8 billion. So there's no control. So it becomes very much, very much like that, you know, water, inf you're moving monies from uh, border infrastructure to a legacy type program kind of stuff. I think we need, you know, just more transparency like that. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like you to comment on your own risk in your position as PBO. Uh, there's the expression, by all means be brave, but don't be suicidal. Uh, do you feel that in retrospect, in some ways, that you were possibly too brave, or in other cases, possibly not brave enough? So if you had it to do all over again, uh, considering what the trade-offs are, that if you're alive, you can do a lot more uh, than if you're not in that job anymore. Yeah. Well, I, I said to the students today that um, in, about two years before I took the job, I lost a son in an accident. And he was like, he was my oldest son. And uh, he, you know, he, so it just, I, just, I said, like, the, for me, it was an epiphany. Like, there's no security. There's just no security. Like, people, like, you say, oh, I'm going to be a public servant. You know, I'm going to have a great career. I'll retire at 65. I'm going to have all these sorts of things. And then, like, boom, all of a sudden, it just disappears. Everything you loved, gone. And then, like, it was like, for me, like, it was, you know, there's a lot of pain that goes through that. And you could, you know, you could do whatever you want with the pain. You could say, I'm going to do something positive to honor a memory. Or you could say, you know, I'm just going to drink a lot. Um, 
And um, I just it felt more better just to say maybe I could try to do something positive. So like it, it, when you see life, you know, if there is no security, like financial security, and if you could lose your health that quickly, or like, you know, honestly, the, a few weeks ago we had a train accident about a few blocks from where I lived where we lost six people, two kids about the same age as my son, who also died by a train. And I ride my bike by that place every day. I, mean, I could just imagine what those parents feel like. You know, 21-year-old kids going to Carleton University, gone. Like, how does that even happen? You know, that, you know the, the things you love more than anything else in the world, your kids. So then you start to say, then the prime minister says, you know, I'm cutting your budget. Ah, oh, fine, cut it, you know. <laughs> you know? Or the prime minister said, you know, or the you know, cabinet minister, you know, you're unbelievable. You're unreliable. You're incredible. Like, I can't believe, like, your, your estimates. Well, that's fine. We're comfortable with them. Where's yours? <laughs> you know? Like, it's honestly. So back to your question, like, was it, you know, brave enough? Like, it felt brave enough. Like, you know, for me, for me it was like, you know, if you're, if you're given, like, you know, under the legislation, you're given like, the responsibility to provide parliament analysis on the economy, on the nation's finances, scrutiny of the estimates costing. Like, if you, like for me, like, I gulped. I didn't, one of the reasons not to take the job, that was too much mandate for me. Like, that's just a scary thing. And I, you know, I, wasn't, you know, I wasn't in jobs I had before where I could pick up the phone and I could say, you know, I'm phoning for the prime minister. I'm at the Privy Council office. I'm his assistant secretary. I need some analysis on a, you know, a tax change, you know, change the tax legislation. And the people say, yes, sir, we're right away. I, you know, you don't get that help at the Parliamentary Budget Office, so um, they would, you know, they're not that going to be that kind of supportive. So, like, it was scary to take on that kind of job. But the, the team that came that wanted to do the work, like, they're they're the real heroes. They actually did the work, you know. And um, and so, a lot of people, like, there's a lot of Canadians willing to do this, a lot. I think, like, all the students that I talked to today are, are more than capable, and will do it. Will do it. I felt brave enough, but not crazy, not suicidal. No, and actually, you know what? Like, people would say, like, oh, you could lose your job. Like, honestly, I'm making more money than I ever did now. Like, where's the downside? <laughs> and I never, you know, honestly, if you don't know me, but I live in a bungalow, you know, far away from town, and I ride my bike to work. Like, I'm not a big shot. I grew up in a house my dad built. He was a machinist. You know, I, I don't need anything more. Like, I, I already eat too much. I drink too much. You know, what else do I want? I have more than enough clothes than I need. Like, I don't need anything more. And I actually, I very, was very happy being a public servant. So, like, where is the fear? We'll make this our last question. Okay. So you were talking about the importance of debate, and my question is, um, what should the next debate be in Parliament? Yeah, I hope, like the speech on the throne, which will probably get tabled, you know, whatever, 15th or 16th, I've lost track of time, and uh, in October. It's, you know, I hope it's not, I hope it's a document that's long-term in, in scope. You know, that, you know, the, the parliamentarians are going to say, yeah, the economy is sluggish right now, but here's where we want to take it to the future. Here's the investments we, that we need to make. You know, I hope, like, for example, on the health care issue, which is gobbling up provincial budgets, it's only going to get worse as we get old over the next two decades. Like, I hope, like, you know, that, you know, if it's not the government, it's the opposition party saying, you know what, we're going to tackle this. Like, we should probably have a royal commission. We should be making decisions over the next few years. We need to put some analysis on the table. You know, and I hope, like, you know, in, you know, people talk about income inequality and those sorts of issues and social programs, whether we have the right social programs to deal with this. I don't see inequality getting you know, and getting better. I think it gets worse, the way our economies are set up. It's certainly getting worse in the United States. We could see some pressure before the recession in Canada. So, like, basically, what are the policies that we want five, to, five years from now they are going to deal with these sorts of issues so everybody gets economic opportunity? You know, because that is the big issue. Like, honestly, back just from my boring story, I grew up in a house my dad built. My dad's a machinist. I got to do jobs to, you know, to get to go to an education. I got to go to school. I had opportunity, amazing opportunity. Like I, you know, school was affordable, even for, just for, you know, I was able to pay my student loans and the rest of it. That's a good country. What are people dying for in the Middle East right now? Housing, education, water. They're dying for it. The kids, like the ones I talked to today, the same age, they're, they're willing to die for it now. It's become such an issue. 
So, but it's, it's, it doesn't have to be like that in Canada. You know, we could be like, we're, and it's not like that in Canada. So, yeah, I want them to talk about these issues like statesmen. Not just about what's in it, like we have pensions and health care for my generation, but pensions and health care for the, your, your, gener, your kids' generation that's here today. You know, so if parliamentarians say, you know, I'm going to get back to fiscal balance, don't do it for me. Do it for our kids. And uh, so that they have, you know, again, going back to the, you know, dead interest charges, if Minister Martin had to spend 38 cents on every revenue dollar for pub, public dead interest charges, Minister Flaherty had 13 cents, let's keep it at 13 cents. But then let's give you, the, you know, let's give the next generation the choices. So good fiscal management is very important. Minister Goodell did a damn good job too, like actually as a finance minister for this country. So yeah, I want those debates. I can go on. You know, on, on, you know, you could talk about the environment, et cetera, et cetera. But you want, I think it's about priorities and policy directions. And then let's start the work. We don't have to make all the decisions in the 2014 budget. Let's just get, let's do our homework. We didn't do our homework on a lot of files over the last few years. Let's start now. And you know, everybody can contribute. Universities can contribute. The new par the parliamentary budget office can contribute. Everybody can, you know, chip in. Center for Policy Alternatives will definitely <laughs> chip in. Definitely chip in. Thank you. On behalf of the CCPA and all of our sponsors, thank you, Kevin. It was a great evening. And you, you can come to a cocktail party at my house anytime. That's